Okay, our next and final interview today at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair for 2012 is Peter Glassman, who is the owner and proprietor of Books of Wonder. And Peter, I'm going to ask you, like I ask everyone else, talk a little bit about your parents, siblings, where you grew up, uh, where did you go to school, and take us, give us a little biopic through college if you went. Okay. Um, I was born here in New York City. My fa parents are both born and bred New Yorkers, born in Brooklyn, both of them. Both went to Brooklyn College. Um, when, uh, when I was 18 months old, my father moved his business from New York to New Jersey and the family as well. So I grew up actually in the suburbs of New Jersey, a small town called West Caldwell. Basically, your basic bedroom community. Um, it was a nice small town, and I uh, went to elementary, junior high, high school there. Uh, luckily, uh, there were two bookstores in town. And one of the, when I was a kid, the big thing was when you were old enough, you were allowed to walk uptown. You know, there were <laughs> there was two streets in our town that had st stores on them. One was Bloomfield Avenue, and the other was Passaic Avenue. Passaic Avenue was very dangerous, you know, very fast driving cars, but Bloomfield Avenue was the main drag. And, you know, it was a nice walk through, you know, semi-busy streets to get there. And I remember when I was about maybe seven or eight years old, my brother, my big brother, walked me up there for the first time. And then as I got older, I got to. And uh, I remember when I entered junior high, I was thrilled because there was a, the t one of the two town's bookstores were very close to the junior high. And I used to go there all the time. The other one was a little bit further away, and I would go there as well. And... Um, just loved both bookstores, always loved books. Uh, my earliest memories of my mother reading to me as a very small child from uh, when we were very young, Bay A. Milne. Um, my parents, both big readers, my brother and my little sister also loved to read. I remember reading to my little sister, she's five years younger than me, when she was you know, two and three years old reading her picture books. Um, ironically, of the three of us, um, I was the one who didn't teach himself to read. My brother and sister both taught themselves to read before going to school. <laughs> I did not, but I <laughs> took to child. it. I, I took to it like a fish to water, though, when I was, you know, taught it. You know, and I just loved it. Um, in fact, I, uh, my parents had joined me to the Dr. Seuss Beginner Book Club, so I'd get a book each month, you know, from a Dr. Seuss book. And in fact, years later, when I met Ted Geisel, Dr. Seuss, um, I said to him, you know, Dr. Geisel, you know, it's such an honor to meet you, but, you know, I got to tell you, you taught me how to read. To which he responded, quite tug in cheek, "Funny, I don't remember doing that." <laughs> so I got to play straight man to Dr. Seuss. But um, at any rate, um, when I was the day I turned 14, which was legal working age in New Jersey, I went to both town bookstores and asked for a job. I just was nuts about books, and they both turned me down. They didn't want a 14-year-old kid working in their store. But when I was 15, one of them did hire me. And about six months later, I started buying for the store. And I just loved it. It was a general new bookstore. Um, in fact, it was half cards and gifts, half books. But they had a very good department, uh, children's department, a very good science fiction department, which were my two interests. And I took them over and really built them up. Um, in fact, one time I overheard one of the uh, owners being asked by a sales rep, where did you get that kid from? He knows so much about the books and everything. They didn't realize I was working in the back stock room at the time. And um, the owner replied, oh, well, he's been shopping here since he was a little boy. He used to rearrange the books back into order when he was shopping. We always knew we were going to hire him when he got old enough. <laughs> <laughs> However, now that I have my own shop, I don't feel the impulse to do it in other people's stores anymore. <laughs> well, good for you. But uh, I worked there throughout high school um, and uh, left for Brown University in the fall of 78. Uh, um, about... A week before I left for college, however, that summer had been a very tumultuous summer for me. I uh, came out, realized I was gay, and came to terms with that, but did not choose to tell my parents yet. 78, it was hardly the matter-of-fact right thing it was today. Yeah. And unfortunately, my parents uh, found out the week before I left for college, so that last week was rather intense. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents, with all the well-meaning of good, loving parents, 
told me they love me, they want to, you know, but they want to cure me. <laughs> yeah, isn't that always the, they want to cure you? Well, you know, they, they meant well, they were trying. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've known far worse things. I've known people whose parents have totally rejected them, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. And my parents were wonderful in the sense that, you know, they, they were awful in the sense that they wanted to change me. They were wonderful in the sense that they were there for me and wanted, wanted to be there for me. They just went about it the wrong way. Mm. Um, but there was no one to tell them the right way at that time, you know? True. Uh, but I left for college, and of course, part of it was, you know, we're paying for your college, you'll do what we tell you, you know? Um, very you know, typical of their generation, and I, I you know, but it, I was always a rebellious spirit, child of the 60s. Um, and so my instant reaction to being told, you have to do something because we're paying for this is, well, maybe I shouldn't have the pay for it. Maybe I shouldn't, you know. So that was in the back of my mind when I went to college. I love Brown. Brown was an amazing experience to be city there. Too. Uh, Providence, and that was just when Providence was going through all this wonderful urban renewal, oh. and it was a great time to be there. But I went down to New York a few weeks after I got there to visit some friends. I think it was over. Um, oh, what was it? It was um, Columbus Day weekend. And there was a dance, gay dance, being given at NYU. And I went, and I met a senior at high, Stuyvesant High School named James Carey, who we hit it off. And by the end of my first semester, I chose to leave college to move to New York to be with him. And we fell in love. We moved in together. And I started, actually, um, I went, I thought I was going to be an actor. Went to HB Studios, studied with a uh, student of Uta Hagen's. Uh, I didn't actually take classes from Uta, but one of her disciples. And uh, but I came. But while I was doing that, I was needed. I wanted to find a job where I could work at night, and I found a bookstore down in Soho that was open to midnight every night, so I could get a nighttime job and work during the day. And in the meantime, I started going to old and rare book fairs, and I discovered Milt Reisman's Victoria Bookshop, and I discovered the Strand, and mm -hmm. there were a couple of Fourth Avenue booksellers still, you know, barely in business, but there. Mm -hmm. And I discovered some of them, and of course I knew Argosy Bookstore, and it was fun, and I, I, I found myself in love with this. I found myself fascinated. And like I had been a big fan of the Oz books as a, as a child. The um, Oz books I had grown up with, though, had only black and white illustrations. When I discovered that they had color in the first editions, I became interested in learning about that and discovering them. And then I went to a real, true antiquarian book fair and met Dan Hirsch, and Dan and I hit it off, and then I met Justin Schiller, and I started to get to know some of the booksellers, and I decided this was something I wanted to do. So I quit my job at um, the General New Bookstore and went to work for Jack Barfield, who, unfortunately, I never met Jack before he had his stroke. Oh, but man. he was still, you know, the stories I heard from the people who were, who were there, and you could still see there was still that eagle yeah. eye and that the mind was there, he just couldn't express it anymore right. because of the stroke. But he was amazing, and uh, I worked there only for three months, but I observed everything there like a sponge. And then I was wandering around the West Village with James, and we saw this little tiny empty store on Hudson Street between Barrow and Morton. And I said, I wonder how much that would be, because I've been looking to rent like a basement space or something to just have an office yeah. and do mail order. But the store was looked like, like it was falling apart. It looked like it needed to be fixed up, but you know, fixed up and like needed painting and patching, yeah, not like it would do. And that was something we felt we could do ourselves. So we found I managed to rent it for four hundred dollars a month. Basement spaces were three hundred dollars a month, so it was like this was a no brainer. I could do hundred dollars a month more with an open store. Yeah. I figured. So we I opened it up, and uh, you know. Picked up as much merchandise as I could afford, et cetera, and opened it up. And, uh, but when I went to open the store, I didn't have as many books as I thought I had. We had more bookshelves than books. So Bookazine, which is the biggest local distributor of new books in the New York region, back then was on West 10th Street between Washington and West Streets. Close by. Which was three blocks from my store. So I walked over there and picked out my favorite children's books to put on the shelves. People went nuts. They loved this hand-picked selection. Before I knew it, the store was half new and half old and rare, and you know, you know some pretty frightening first few months. You know, business was oh, yeah. you know tough. But uh, in fact, I remember one night being scared to death. How am I going to pay my bills? Blah, blah blah. And the next day, I went in, and there was a ch uh, certified check from Bettina Herleman, 
for $2,500, very famous Swiss bookseller and publisher, um, for some antique books we had from a catalog, and that got us through that next month or two. Wow. And you know, things kept going, and we kept making ends meet, and uh, then it started to take off. Um, at, James started helping out on weekends and things, and the next thing I know, he decided this is what he wanted to do. So he became my partner in the business, as well as in life. Yeah. And we moved, after two years, to a bigger space. And four years later, we took a store up on 7th Avenue and 18th Street, and then it just continued to grow and grow. Um, I got involved with publishing and reissuing books, um, and our inventory of Old and Rare grew. We got known very much for, our, for about the Oz books, because my fascination them never left me, and we were yeah. lucky. I mean, I remember the third year I was in business, uh, we got a letter from um, the publisher of the, the uh, Oz books, or the actually the uh, uh, I guess the the, the, prede the, the the not predecessor, whatever the opposite word would be, I'm escaping the moment. But anyway, the heir to the publishing yeah. group, the publisher who had you know had their records and everything. Wanted to know if I'd be interested in buying the artwork from the Oz books. And I was like, mm. um, possibly, you know, <laughs> certainly I'm interested. So we flew out to Chicago and went to the contemporary book company's offices. And there they had hundreds of drawings from the Oz books, going wow. back all the way to as early as 1905. Wow. And, you know, we had to negotiate a price with them, and it was hard, and I had to get a client to finance it because I didn't have that kind of money. Yeah. And, but it, all worked out, the client got a ton of great art, plus made, basically made back everything they invested, plus we made a nice profit on it, and it certainly cemented our reputation. Yeah, well, yeah I would think it'd be a reputation builder, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, you know, and just continued to go from there, and it's, uh, you know, that's how I got into it. I was lucky, my father, I should, I, you asked about family, my father owned his own business, he started on his own, he was the youngest of seven children, so by the time he grew up, was old enough to start his own business, his own father had been retired. But his father had his own business as well. And my mom's father ran their the family business he inherited from his father, and he ran. So I was raised by people you know, who were in an in a, in a entrepreneurial atmosphere and was always curious about business. You know, I would be always fascinated with the behind the scenes, how things yeah. worked and how they, how did you buy this, how did you price this, how, you know. So it came naturally to me, and I was lucky that I had that economical background to go with my fascination and love of books and literature. So uh, are you still at 18th Street and 7th Avenue? Is, uh, where are you now? 18th and 7th our third store. We were there for 10 years. Then we moved. To, what happened was 7th Avenue, when we moved there, Barney's New York was just about to open their big women's store. Yeah. And that was the big thing. We left after Barney's closed and you know declared bankruptcy and everything. By then, 6th Avenue had become the Hot Avenue. Yeah. Okay. And, and so we moved to 18th between 5th and 6th. And we took a store that was about 1,500 square feet. We were there for eight years. And then the store next to us, which had been uh, a restaurant space and had been through three failed restaurants in the eight years we'd been next door, yeah. we managed to talk. The landlord for that space was also our landlord. So we arranged to take over that space, sublet part of the space to a cafe, and that's where we are now, where we've been now for about seven years. So you have a cafe as part of your... Yes. Now, the cafe, you said you subleased it to someone else. Correct. And so it's not, it has nothing really to do with you except the fact that people can have a cup of coffee or something while they look at Exactly, it. although actually the, the people we sublet to have since run into financial difficulty right. and we're going to be taking it over and managing ourselves very shortly. You're probably going to be better off that way. Anyhow. Probably, except I don't, you know, I don't need, it, I'm not interested in, man, in doing food. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's another headache. I, can, I would just be happy to collect rent and not worry about it. But right. if I can't collect rent, I got to do something to make the, <laughs> make the space pay for itself. Okay, tell me where the, where the name Books of Wonder comes from? I, having grown up in a family business and watched how overwhelmingly absorbing running a business is to an owner and entrepreneur and how hard it is to separate yourself from your business, the last thing I wanted to do was put my name on the business. And all the booksellers I knew, Daniel Hirsch, yeah. Justin Schiller, yeah. Joanne Reisler, Doris Fronsdorf, all their business was their name. I didn't want that. I didn't want I wanted to be able to keep my, uh, my identity separate from my business. 
And I was just playing with names and with ideas. And my two loves were science fiction and fantasy and children's books. And actually, for the first year or two, we did both until I discovered that the theft rate was 10 times in science fiction and fantasy what it was in children's books. So I got rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need the headache. Um, but the ch um, and that's where Books of Wonder came from because I, I want that because of the sense of wonder and the sense of adventure and imagination, which I have always associated with books. How many people uh, do you have working for you? About 20 right now. Wow, that's a lot of people. It's quite an enterprise, yeah. Quite, quite, a, quite a payroll. Well, you know, seven, oh yeah, seven days a week, you know, t uh, nine, ten hours a day, we're open. And plus I've got a mail order division, a website, uh, you know. Wow. You're a busy diva. <laughs> My God. I, I generally don't have time for tiddly weeks. <laughs> um, do you have an internet presence? Yes. Uh, a homepage, do you do, do, you do a, a bit of your business? What percentage of your business would you say is shop, catalog, internet, book fair? Can you compartmentalize that? I would say about 80 to 85% of our business, well, let's say 80% of the business is store. Um, 75 to 80. About 10 to 15 is mail order and internet. You can't separate the two because the catalog goes out and people go online to buy the things. Right. I, so I they're not separable anymore. There was a time when they were, yeah. but they're not. Um, it's what they call the click and mortar approach as opposed to brick and mortar, click and mortar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and another five or six, another five to 10% of it is, and I'm probably over 100% at this point, but I'm just guesstimating, yeah. is my personal sales to my personal good customers, the people who I personally handle. I'll get something special in for a painting, a really rare book, you know, and I handle them myself. You know, the day-to-day -day customers are happy to work with my staff, who's quite knowledgeable and expert, but they're those customers who want my personal attention. Right. And, you know, I mean, for a while I had a very good customer in California. I used to fly out four or five times a year to present them with specific things I knew were of interest to them. That's the old, old school selling. Well, you know, have book, will travel. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way I used to do it. Suitcase, off to Brigham Young, you know? off to University of California, off to University of Washington. But they don't do that nowadays. People no, and, you know, so. the recession, well, you know, with the art and the truly rare books, the really special ones, you do need to see them. Oh, yeah. But unfortunately, the recession also, several clients of mine who had been major collectors for many, many years, saw it as sort of a sign to, okay, Time to cut back, time to stop. I've been done this long enough. Yeah. And recently, for example, a client who literally within a month or two of going to business became a client. And I helped the one who uh, I've helped build their collection, one of the great Oz collections of all time, came to me a couple of years ago and said, I think it's time to sell it. You know, I've enjoyed it, I've loved it, I've got practically everything. There are a few things I don't have, but there's only one of the there's only one copy known in the world, and I know where those are, yeah. and they're not coming out of the market. Hmm. You know, and they had quite a number of one-of-a-kinds, you know, um, and he said, it's, it's time, and I've been very, quite, uh, you know, lucky to have that opportunity to buy back a great collection yeah. and sell it for them. I know. Uh, so often nowadays, people are sending in material to auction. Yeah, but the problem with auction is you may get good, wonderful prices for the really, really great items. Yeah, but what about the rest? But no collection is all great items. Right. And the rest goes for peanuts. So Far less than what it should be. Yeah. So, well, it's glad it, it's good that you you can do that kind of thing. There's lots of people who simply can't buy back what they've already sold from a financial point of view. Well, fortunately, um, in many cases, I have clients who work with me on consignment or whatever. You know, they're happy to work with us. Yeah. There's, you know, I'm I'm a big believer that business is about relationships. Oh yeah, totally. And I've always, you know, and I've it's interesting because this client was extremely successful. And when we first met them, they, you know, he was up and coming, not at that point, became very, very successful later on. But, you know, one of the things that we always talked about was, you know, uh, we both shared a common philosophy that a good deal is a deal where everyone does well. Yeah, there, there was never, you know, we would, you know, we would go back and forth a little, trying each to get the better of each other, almost as a joke. You know, it was almost a game with us. Yeah. Um, but it was never a sense of, you know, we both, we always worked on a handshake. 30 years we've done business together, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise going back and forth, and we've never done it, never had anything more than a handshake between us. 
it's that kind of a business when you yes. think about it. Yeah, and yeah. it's one of the few things. It's one of the things I've one of the few businesses left in the world that is still like that. Absolutely, I, I shudder to think of some other businesses who might try to do something. Oh like that. well, you know, I've been in the book industry. <sighs> this fall will make thirty-seven years, and I mean, I literally started when I was fifteen, and I can tell you there have been humongous changes, both in the antiquarian end and the new book end. But the difference on the old and rare is more on the collector and consumer end and much less the dealers. Mm -hmm. The really serious dealers, including the young ones who are coming up and come along, and sadly there aren't enough of them, but the ones I admire and really enjoy welcoming to the fold are the ones who do take seriously bibliography, do understand that this is a business that involves research and learning and growing with your, in your knowledge. And that seems to be a constant, which is great to see. Whereas on the new book end, the industry has so changed. Um, yeah. It's become, uh, it used to be very much that booksellers and publishers were partners. And yeah. really that partnership has been very badly frayed over the last decade or so. And it's sad to see because, uh, and of course now publishers are all of a sudden realizing how much they need the bookstores. Oh, yeah. That, um, in, an, in, a, in a world without bookstores, you know, they were so big on they were going to get books into Target and Walmart and all this stuff. And, but no one discovers books there. No. People go there for what they already know and have heard about elsewhere. And they need a place, they need that incubator for books. And of course, this is my concern. I have an even greater concern as an old and rare book dealer because we need that. We need people to discover and fall in love with books so that they gain value as first editions because, and particularly today where consumers' interest in books is more and more based on knowledge of them from popular culture, much less than historical reference or historical importance, which is sad because, you know, uh, my, you know, I remember for, oh, Justin was always, Justin Schiller, who's been a mentor to me, as has Dan Hirsch, both of them always were very big on, um, you know, the early, beautiful picture books yeah, and yeah. children's books and the chap books and of the 19th and 18th century. And I always stayed away from the 18th century stuff because I always thought it was a little too specialized and required a really knowledgeable, knowledgeable client. And I just felt that was a diminishing range of people. And sadly, I was right. And there are oh, yeah. fewer and fewer people who even know who John Newberry was other yeah. than that he, there's an award name for him. Yeah, that's about it. That's you know? Right. And um, Harris, forget it. They've never heard of Jay Harris. And it's sad, you know, because this is our history. And it's, it's you know, hopefully there will always be institutions like the Groyer Club and, you know, organizations like the Antiquarian um, Society and, you know, who will keep this knowledge alive and maintain it. But on the, you know, it's no longer a big field of collectible, mm -hmm. sadly. You mentioned uh, a few moments ago about young dealers that you were talking about some young dealers who you feel very comfortable and confident with. Would you be able to tell us who you, who you think are gonna be the comers? Well, the first one that comes to mind is Scott Emerson, um, who has, you know, he is, he's always interested in learning, knowledgeable about books, very involved, you know, he takes seriously his obligation as a bibliophile, that he has to, you know, that it's not just, oh, well, I think it's a first. It's he has to know it's no, a first. Right. Uh, I remember years ago, there was a bookseller out in California who was never an ABAA member. And I would have protested if someone had suggested them because this, they told me, was their philosophy. Well, if you can't prove it's not a first, then we assume it's a first. <laughs> Well, and that's just the there. backwards way to look at it. It's got to be, unless you can prove it a first, it's not a first. You could say possible first. Even I will occasionally say probable first because there'll be an inscription from, let's say, six months after publication. Yeah. And it's unlikely this book would have been reprinted within six months. But I can't prove it. So it's not a first. Probable, but not definitive. I and you have to know where to draw those lines. I think one of the big things with children's books is condition. Very much so. Because as a children's book, you would think that children would handle it or mishandle it, as the case <laughs> may be. And it's so infrequently that you get to see a really 
beautiful copy of an important children's book. You find that to be the case? Oh, very much so. I mean, we, you know, as an open store, people bring us boxes and bags of books all the time. I can imagine. And, you know, you never want to say no because you never know you what's are. there. Yeah. Um, nowadays, the internet, people will send us photographs, and sometimes I can just tell from the photograph, yeah. forget it. But they don't even know what the photograph. You know, the photograph, the copyright page, you know, they'll show me the copyright date, but not the printing information. Right. <laughs> Well, clever. But, you know, I always tell people, it's one of those funny things I say to customers, you know, we're taught everything about books in school, but how to care for them and how to tell what printing they are. That's, that's right. <laughs> but they bring in books and you know, they'll be totally dilapidated. And you can see they love these books. These books aren't, you know, these are books from their childhood or their children's childhood. And I always say to them, well, they were obviously very well-loved copies, but they're not collectible. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it, well-loved. And yeah, because they were, obviously. You know, I remember, um, in fact, my friend Justin Schiller many years ago showed me an amazing copy of Through the Looking Glass he had that literally the red linen had that sheen to it like a brand new book. Really? Mm. And we're talking about a 150-year-old book. Yeah. And, you know, I was, my mind you know, 125 years, but anyway, I was like, I said, how did a copy like this survive? He goes, I imagine that, you know, probably some poor child was given to who died and never read and was wrapped in paper or in old clothes and put in a drawer and of forgotten that. for a hundred years, you know, because that. that was often what happened when a child died, that things were lovingly put away, not disposed of, you know, and of course, child mortality was so much more yeah, it's a lot different. Common, you yeah. know, back then. Um, so, you know, I mean, so sometimes I see these amazing copies of a book. You know, someone will bring a, a, a 19th century picture book I'll see in the original jacket. And I'm amazed, but I'm a little sad, you yeah. know, because obviously no one read this. No one yeah. cared for it, which is, you know, bittersweet. What, what, what are you going to do? Um, do you do much in the way of pop-up? Books. Oh, sure. Robert What's Sabuda, who is the king of the modern pop-ups, the modern-day Megendorfer, um, is a very dear friend. Um, you know, we had him for a signing for his very first pick, his very first pop-up, and, uh, you know, has be had been back to the store for many events. And, of course, his books are very collectible. You know, I mean, he's been doing this now for 20 years. And, uh, and of course, the older pop-ups are just amazing. The um, Cabista and the uh, and Megendorfer and you know the um, beautiful pop-ups from the 20s and 30s that were done. Yeah, some of that stuff is just incredible. Oh yeah, the yeah. artistry is tremendous. Of course, the sad thing was is that they could do things back in the 19th century because labor, you know, they used child labor and pay people so little that we can't do economically today because there's no way to automate the process mm -hmm. and the handwork is just too complex. What do you see as the future of our business? Does it have a future? Um, yes, yes, very much so. I think, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things that's annoyed me very much over the last five years or so have been all these technology prognosticators who write about the death of the book. Everyone will be reading on tablets and screens. And I look at them and say, think to myself, what kind of childhood did you have? Yeah, yeah. I mean... Who, you know, jacks are still around. You know, people still play, you know, rubber, those rubber balls we all play with, kids still play with. Why? Because mom and dad played with them and they introduced them to their children because they want to relive with their childhood their special memories. And what memories are more precious than the bedtime story? Reading to your child. I mean, I'm not a parent, I'm, an, I'm a very, very proud uncle. Mm -hmm. And I love reading to my nieces and nephew, you know, and Great, reading them my yeah. favorite books. Oh, it's wonderful. And of course, you know, I would buy them my favorite books. I remember my nephew turned three years old. For his third birthday, I brought him a copy of Where the Wild Things Are, which oh. came out when I was three years old. Wow, that's, that's quite a thing. And I read it to him, and he loved right. it. And it was like, yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> the kid's yeah. okay. My grandkids uh, like, the Seuss, like the Seuss books. Seuss is forever. And I'm sorry, yes, you can make something clever of them on a screen or on a tablet or whatever, but it's a different experience. Yeah, than looking at the book. And the so. experience of turning a page mm -hmm. and, and a child pointing to the picture and touching it with their hand and feel it. It's, it's a tactile, physical experience, sharing a book with a child. And that will go on forever. And, and because of that, there will be always a, because we will start with that, and that will cement people's love of reading, 
There will always be a fondness for paper, print on paper. Lev Grossman wrote a wonderful piece oh, about six months or so ago in the New York Times, an op-ed piece. He's a best-selling adult author. And he wrote about how the difference, the technological actual achievement of going from the scroll to the codex. And a book is a codex. Yeah. And he talked about the intuitiveness of flipping between pages and going back and going forward. And I remember that now. I, you know, I would think, yeah, sometimes when, I have, when I'm reading a book and I haven't had a chance to read it for a few days, a character will be referenced, like, who is that again? And I'll flip back and find a reference to them. In an ebook, that would be a real pain in the neck. Right. Because an ebook, as he pointed out, is really much more like a scroll than a codex. And of course, I also heard at um, the Consumer Entertainment show in Las Vegas, when all the apps came out and apps were the big yeah. deal, they interviewed a gentleman who sold apps and he was doing something, you know, e-book e apps, and, he, and, they, and they interviewed him about this. They said, well, do you think this will replace books? He goes, oh no, there's nothing more intuitive than print on paper. No one can ever beat that. Our job is to offer something different, something that paper can't offer, but there will never be anything better than reading print on paper. And I believe that. And I think most people instinctively do and what's more interesting is all the surveys and studies show that even people who, that people who buy ebook readers and actively buy ebooks still continue to buy printed books and in many cases buy more printed books because of the ebook reader than they did before they had an ebook reader that now they because they read more because they carry it with them they then turn and want the book in hardcover to hold on to so i think it's forever of course my big problem with an ebook reader you can't read while you're circling in an airport to land. And I'll, I'd go nuts if I had to turn off my book. Well, well, <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much. The 30 minutes have flown by. Enjoyed it tremendously. And, my pleasure. And good luck with uh, Books of Wonder. <laughs> thank you very much.